do we grow from complacency? After years of sitting on my ass, waiting for the world to magically lavish me with the gifts of dreams unpursued, I decided to do something with my life. A new view. Hit the music. Here's what I do know to be true. Life is a risk. Indecision is costly. Do the work, and the rest will come to you in time. Our first vintage was 98. Before that time, you know, the 90s, uh, the region was dismissed. The wine industry in the Hudson Valley has been working hard over the last decades to raise the bar on quality and change the perception from 20, 30 years ago that said this is a region that produces low-end, cheap, sweet wines. We're definitely at a point where the quality is great, where even at the Culinary Institute, the professors are saying, wow, New York winemaking has come a long way and is really interesting. But that's you know, still not quite where the general public is. I'm a little concerned, just as we're getting really good, people are so excited about cocktails and uh, beer. craft beer <laughs> yeah. that we're gonna get lost in the shuffle. And there's a lot to discover here. The Hudson Valley just doesn't get a lot of write-up. It's always the Finger Lakes, and it's always the North Fork of Long Island, and uh, it's time to change that. For sure, our Marquette, which is a Minnesota varietal, is the earliest to bud, so it's May 1st. This is about the time where we might start getting some pushing. You can see it's starting to push a little bit. Between five to six years ago is when these were planted. You see it's barely pushing out now, but once this gets to about an inch, sticking out or once you start seeing leaves pop out of here, that's when if a really cold morning hits where we're in below freezing, it could knock out all those buds. We have Capron, Riesling, Chardonnay. We have a little bit of Merlot, not much. We have a little bit of Gewurz. Our largest planting, which is Gamay. We were only one of, I think, two farms in the state that were growing Gamay at one point, but it's become so cool and hip to have yeah, Gamay yeah, now yeah. that a lot more people are doing it in New York. I notice there's a lot of slate around here. Yeah, it's a big slate, as you can see. It's the White Cliffs, so that's all slate. But most of the flats and over there, it's a lot of clay, some sandy spots. We've spent decades figuring out what does grow well here. On a broad brush level, it's cool climate wine. It's definitely got more in common with Northern Europe than California. For all that California gets great ripeness and high sugar that translates to deep color and jammy fruitiness, that also means very high alcohol and low acid. Acid is an essential part of good wine, mm -hmm. and that is a benefit to cool climate winemaking. Ah, the harvest. That special time of year when you're rewarded or haunted for the decisions you made during the growing season. The days are long, really long. For three or four months, everything you hold dear in life takes a back seat to these grapes. If you are married with a family, you've officially earned the title of harvest widow. If you're single, well, it sucks to be you. So enjoy the endless nightmares of grapes attacking you. And for the die-hard romantics, it's a lifetime of purple hands.
we do a lot more of barrel topping with our ears than we do with our eyes or anything else. You can really kind of hear as you're topping a barrel. Of course, we overflow a little bit every once in a while, but. <laughs> I've spilled so much wine before it too. Oh, but, yeah, for sure. You know, it's eh, when you're. <laughs> When you're an intern, they you can't they, help it. They can't, yeah. You can't help it a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. But most of us got involved here in Hudson Valley because it was, we're really passionate about the wine, and it wasn't just a going into it because it, you know you saw this as your career. It's like no, this it was a lifestyle, the whole different mindset of going into it, and that's what also makes I think the Hudson Valley so cool is that. You do have a lot of people who aren't going into it with you know, preconceived notions or thinking that you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. It's like I try new stuff all the time. It sounds silly, but making a blend of Pinot and Cap Franc, which you know you're not allowed to do if you're in France or somewhere like that. You know, it's it's taboo. But here we can do those things and really kind of seeing what you can bring out of it. Experimentation is a constant, not only in winemaking, but in life as well. The first couple of trips out west were glimpses of a life I had longed for, but I wasn't ready to let go of home. I loved home, and those back-to-back -back harvest seasons resulted in a return back to New York each time. After going back and forth, I knew I had to make a decision to stay or not so I took a risk. It may not be the perfect place in the Hudson Valley to grow grapes, but it's certainly the perfect place to sell wine. So we've got one of the pieces covered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People love to come and sit and look at this view. This site tends to be cold because something about the ridge there, the cold air drops down off the ridge and looks for the lowest spots. My husband calls it grape growing on the edge. <laughs> the edge of what's possible. Right, right. <laughs> and the edge is moving in terms of climate change. I wouldn't want to give anyone the impression that it's making it easier to make wine here in the Hudson Valley. A few years back, the first and second week of April, we had something like 10 days of 90 degree weather. That's totally abnormal. So that year, everything was butted way out. Then we got a normal hard freeze, not even a frost. And so all of the green is just then gone. We were explaining to people for a month after that why the vineyard looked dead. So that's the kind of thing that climate change can do. Odd swings of weather that are really bad for agriculture, you know, will have impact on a scale most people haven't begun to grasp yet. You know, there's usually water involved in a cool climate region. So the Finger Lakes totally do that. They're very deep. Long Island is the warmest of our New York growing regions because of the ocean. But here you need to be right on the Hudson. Here we instead have the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the cliff dropping cold air on us. Yep. But that's why we uh, made the move to adding a vineyard in, um, right on the river. And that's the result of my husband's 40 years of grape growing in the region. He got a chance at planting vines there and was like, this is one of the best places in the entire region to grow grapes. We're doing it. <laughs> We're up here at one of the most awe-inspiring vineyard sites I've ever seen in my entire life. Let's take a look. You have this feeling of your grape grower searching for the perfect site. You know the limitations if you've been growing grapes as long as I have of the different sites that you're at. You look at this one, you go, I know I can produce just great grapes here. This site is special for a couple of reasons, not only because of the spectacular view, but this site is one of the warmest sites on the entire Hudson River. This was six degrees warmer on the coldest days this winter. That makes life a lot easier. It has a slope, so there's good air drainage. 
and it has good water drainage, all the things grapevine need to succeed. I think I'm the only vineyard in the valley that has drip irrigation. We do that because we want to deliver nutrients to each of the plants and not just spread it all over the hillside and have it washed down into the river. The biggest source of contamination for waterways in the United States is point source runoff. We didn't want to be part <laughs> of that crowd. We wanted to be a shining example of what to do. So now you're seeing probably the showcase vineyard in the Hudson Valley in terms of precision agriculture. Holy moly. Okay. It gets steeper wow. here. <laughs> so this is where wow. farming gets hard <laughs> when yeah. you start oh, to yeah. get hillsides that are this steep. Wow. We're in the Cabernet Franc section of the vineyard right now. These vines are two years old, starting their third year. And you can see, I'm quite proud of the amount of growth that we got in just two years. You know, they look like four or five year old vines. This is something called Indian tobacco, and it's an, an invasive plant species. We're always fighting these things. This is uh, Canada thistle, another invasive species. And if you look around here, you'll see morning glory. Very pretty if you have it in your garden. Not so nice when it starts to strangle your vines. <laughs> are these are these just a single trunk or do you use multiple trunks if say at home we use multiple trunks but this is such a, a benign site warm site that we're using single trunks here but you can see in some cases my guys even though i tell them only single trunk but here's two trunks you know so yep. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what mood they're in on a given day whether they want to listen to me or not <laughs> they always know better <laughs> white cliffs olana vineyard goes beyond the cultivation of wine grapes. Built in 1872, the now Olana State Historic Site that overlooks the vineyard was home to landscape painter Frederick Church. Just standing here, I can feel the brushstrokes in the hands that once painted the landscape in front of me. One can't deny Michael Migliori's extraordinary vision for the Olana vineyard. It's something I feel the artists here would have dreamt of painting more than a hundred years ago. Gamay, I'll glug glug this shit for days. It's a really interesting wine. It's got a lot in common with Pinot Noir. It is a light bodied, low tannin red. The finish is, um is a little short, but it's just the, the acidity is what keeps- Mouth-watering. Mouth-watering, mouth yeah. and that's what I love about. I'm a, an acidity, acidity holic. <laughs> <laughs> Blows right off your tongue, Yeah, right it? off, yeah, <laughs> to think about it. Uh, <laughs> so this is a Cab Franc, all grown right here. And as a region, our signature grape. Immediately, I'm getting a lot of like the woodsy notes, of cedar and a little bit of, um, actually a little bit of cigar ash as well too. Pencil shavings, Pencil I like shavings that one. Pencil shavings, the yeah. whole bit. Brings me back to- uh, Grade school. To, to grade school, yeah. Number two pencils Number two and pencils. Uh, SATs. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers yelling at me. <laughs> but there's also raspberry in oh, this there's, for yeah, sure. Oh, there's a real, real ripe raspberry in there as well, yep. And do you get any green pepper? I do not actually. None in this one? And, and yeah. that is, I know that's very synonymous with Cap Francs, yeah. but in this one I don't. I get, I get more of a woodsy, fruity flavor yeah. to it. Well, the green pepper is very typical of Cap Franc, and we've actually worked very hard to control it because it can take over Cap Francs. And you can get a wine that makes you think, this is all about vegetables and not yes. about fruit. What we do to control that is you strip off leaves that are shading the fruit, thereby expose the grapes to as much sun as possible and air circulation. And uh, that really does diminish the development of methoxypyrazines, mm -hmm. the compound that gives you that uh, bell pepper aroma. This is Pinot Noir, one of our many dry rosés. And it is the very first wine, the first vintage of any kind, 
from our new Olana Vineyard. And it's also the first time in 20 years that we've changed our label in any way. We basically wanted to make it clear that these are White Cliff wines, but there's something different mm -hmm. because it's a very big deal to establish what's gonna be 10 acres of new high-end vinifera grapes in a region like this one. It just does not happen every day and it's a huge amount of expense and work and really speaks to our level of commitment to the grape growing process. I get a lot of strawberry, a little bit of sour cherry. Mm -hmm. like, uh, stony, I like got mm -hmm. a stony minerality. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to put into words the magnitude of my decision to leave Kingston, New York for California's central coast. The truth is, by my second trip to California, I really wanted things to change. I had met so many influential people, including the love of my life, tasted wines so sublime they bared comparison to great sex. Okay, maybe not that good, but pretty close. You know, this is really not a business for people who are in a hurry. You have to do it slowly, especially if you're establishing a new vineyard on land that hasn't been vineyard land. You've got to figure it out. We're about to put in a new four acre plot up at the Olana Vineyard and deciding what to grow is fascinating yeah. uh, and challenging and scary. We so far have Cabernet Franc, Pinot Noir and Gamay Noir there. We've gone back and forth on what else we should put in there. And Michael had been talking about Syrah, and I was a little skeptical. I'm not an expert in Syrah, but I believe it's, you know, more tended to be grown in warmer climates. But the guys at the culinary were really complimentary about cool climate Syrahs and saying that that, in their mind, was a real plus, mm -hmm. not a negative with Syrah. I honestly think you should go for it because yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely yeah. a, it would definitely be a great kind of experiment and mm -hmm. it would kind of continue your portfolio as well as the Hudson Valley's portfolio right. of experimenting right. mm -hmm. and, and seeing what you get out of them. The most difficult thing for a viticulturist is to determine what variety of grapes in Napa Valley that's easy. You play Cabernet Sauvignon, it's Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. If you're in the Russian River Valley, you plant Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. You just turn around to your neighbor and you say, what did, what did you plant? <laughs> you do the same thing. Our next adventure, which will be another four acres going in, we're gonna plant Syrah. I love the grapes and my idea of Syrah is Northern Rhone Syrah. I think we have the climate for it. If you look at the number of growing degrees days in the Northern Rhone, it's around 3,000, 3,200 growing degree days. And guess what? We are 3,000 to 3,200 growing degree days. So <laughs> I think we can pull it off. So Syrah is the future then? Syrah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come back in three or four years and taste it and let me know. Well, we will. Yeah. If you take a look behind me and you just see this vast vineyard site, personally, I would not guess the Hudson Valley. I would think uh, Northern California and up in Sonoma, hell, even the Santa Rita Hills of Santa Barbara County. This is something to be said about what can be done here in the Hudson Valley. Is, is Michael still with you? Oh, uh, no, he, uh, he, well, he's probably still here, but he's, uh, okay. he's probably up on the hill uh, okay. doing some stuff. Tell him, tell him I said hello. I only have three classes left. They're all in New York City, so uh, and they're all on 59th and Park Avenue. Okay. 